Testing one, two. Testing one, two. Good morning, everybody. Test one, two. Test one, good. Welcome to Life Church. Um, welcome those on live stream. Worship.
the Lord Almighty. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. Of the world, his blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. So open up the before the King of Kings, the God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring. And fighting our battles, every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the battles, every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Your 
invite you to come this morning and we thank you Lord for your presence that we already experience in this place today you said that where two or three were gathered in your name that you would be in the midst Lord and this little building God has suddenly become the house of God we sense your presence and we feel your glory in this house today Lord we bless Tanner and Haley as they begin their lives together as a married couple and we just ask Lord God that the joy that they experienced yesterday God would just continue Lord God in their lives from this day forward God I pray for Bob Kozma Lord who tore his Achilles heel yesterday and is gonna have surgery this week and 
We're just asking that you would touch his body, Lord. We pray for Jason Hawkey, Lord, who continues to have treatments, God, for cancer. And we're just asking, God, for complete healing, Lord. We love you. We thank you for it, God. And we just ask that you'd bless the remainder of this service in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. And could you all join me in wishing Emmeline a happy 20th birthday today? <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Emmeline. Happy birthday to you. Yay. And this was Emmeline's first time to lead without Tanner. Didn't she do a great job today? Thank you very much. We're real excited. We have her parents in the house today, here after the wedding, and grandparents. It was so great to meet uh, the grandparents last night, and uh, actually his dad was a, was a pastor and is a teacher in a Christian school, and grandfather uh, pastored for 40 years at one congregation and is pastoring again. Just can't get away from it. They're going to help us with communion at the end of the service. Um, just a word about this whole COVID time that we're in. We went to one service. Uh, the crowds are starting to build again and come back, and we want to make sure that we, and that, yeah, thank God for that. Amen. But uh, we want to be, um, you know, mindful of, you know, trying to be safe and all that. So we are going to add a second service, but we're going to wait until the first Sunday of November. So the first Sunday of November is what we've targeted for to go back to two services and, um, that way we'll get through fall break and some of the other uh, things that are coming. But we don't do our normal shake hands time, but why don't you just turn to your neighbor and tell them they look amazing, and uh, then you can be seated. <laughs> Welcome to Life Church. Whether you're joining us online or in the building, we are so excited to have you here. Small groups are how we care for each other. And whether you're meeting online or six feet apart, there is a small group for you. This semester, we have a wide variety to choose from and signing up is super simple. You can sign up on the Church Center app or on lifechurchknoxville.com under the Life Groups tab. You can click or tap on the link there to see all of the groups we have and easily sign up as well. This works on a PC or a mobile device. Are you new to Life Church? If so, please fill out a connection card and drop it off in the offering bucket at the end of service. You'll receive more information about the church and get a gift. If you have a prayer request, then the connection card is a great place to write that down. Drop it off in the offering bucket at the end of service and our prayer team will pray for you. Thank you for your continued giving. Through your generosity, we are still able to provide these services as well as support our missionaries. There are four ways for you to give. Number one is online at lifechurchknoxville.com through our giving page. Number two is the Church Center app. Number three, you can mail in your donations to 1015 Cedar Lane, Knoxville, Tennessee, 37912. And number four is if you're in the building today, you can drop off your offering in the bucket at the door as you exit. Well, that's it for this week, Life Church. Remember to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and at our website, lifechurchknoxville.com. We'll see you next time. Bye.
Well, good morning, everybody. We are in the middle of one of the longer series that I've ever done. I normally try to have a series last anywhere from four to six weeks or somewhere in there. This is the sixth in this series, and we're not, we're not really close to done yet. And the reason is because it's a series on the wilderness experience that God's people went through after they left Egypt. And uh, you can't run through the wilderness. You meander through the wilderness. Uh, God's people spent 40 years uh, in the wilderness. I promise we will not be 40 years on this series. Uh, but uh, just a little bit about how I kind of came to this series. There's different ways in which you know, I kind of choose a series. Sometimes it's just something that God's kind of laid on my heart for our congregation at a particular time. But uh, for this particular series, I actually consulted something that's called the lectionary. And the lectionary is... Um, passages of scripture that much of the wider church uses uh, for their texts on any given Sunday morning. So the Methodists today, for instance, and the Lutherans, and uh, even a lot of the Catholic churches uh, would be preaching from the same texts that we're covering uh, during this series. At least, and, and in this case, there's always a New Testament and an Old Testament choice, and we're using the Old Testament choice for this series. Uh, having said that, the, the message for this particular Sunday was when Moses um, was asked to strike the rock or to, to touch the rock and that water would flow from the rock. And then next Sunday, we were supposed to deal with the, what we know as the Ten Commandments or the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. But as I got to looking at that, I thought, you know, I really can't do the Ten Commandments in one Sunday. And I also thought that, that the water coming out of the rock was similar enough to our last Sunday sermon where we talked about how God brought bread in the desert, bread in the wilderness similar to water from the rock. So I'm skipping ahead to the Ten Commandments so I can give it not just one Sunday, but we're going to give it uh, two Sundays because it is so important. If God... If God had a highlighter, he showed how he lets us know that something is important. When we, when we want to say that something we've read is important, we'll underline it right with a yellow highlighter. I'll fold the page or you might put a bookmark in it. God has much more um, amazing ways of saying what I'm getting ready to say is really important. And what he does is he calls his people who are now two months out of Egypt, he calls them to Mount Sinai, and Moses would have been very familiar with this place because it's the place where we began this series with the burning bush, and God spoke to Moses, and, and, and he told him to take off his shoes because he was on holy ground, and then there was sort of a foreshadowing, and he said, and you will come and worship me at this mountain. So not only is it as important for what I'm doing right now, but this mountain is going to have later significance, and we're now to that later significance, and we're going to find out why this mountain was such a big deal. The way that God used his highlight was he, uh, he set a boundary, and he said, you don't get close to this mountain. In fact, if you get too close to this mountain, you're going to die. Not only that, he had the mountain shake. The mountain shakes. There's fire and there's smoke on the mountain. And it's the only time when the actual voice of God is heard. And it's so disturbing to the people that they ask that God would discontinue speaking because it's so much for them to bear. So what we're going to be talking about this morning is really important. This is God's highlighter. This is God saying, what I'm getting ready to say is extremely important. And you would think if I'm going to do two weeks, I might do five this Sunday and five next Sunday. But I'm actually not because 
the Hebrews saw the two tablets that the commandments were on divided between the first four commandments on the first and the last six on the second command, on the second tablet. So today we're going to deal with the first four, what we know as the commandments, but that's not really accurate from the Hebrew what, uh, what these were, and we're going to talk about that in, in just a moment. But because it's so important, because this is God's highlighter, because we are hearing the word of the Lord this morning, would you stand in honor of the reading of God's word as we read from Exodus chapter 20, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. Then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must have no other gods before me. You must not make yourself an idol or any kind of an image of anything in the heavens on the earth, heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not misuse the name of God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. And remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Heavenly Father, I, we just honor your word today, God, and I just pray that we would get the import of these words into our hearts and into our lives today. Jesus, and all God's people, amen. amen. You may be seated. The Hebrews don't call it the, the Ten Commandments. They call it the Decalogue, Deca Ten, and Log words. From the Hebrew, it literally means that God was giving them ten words. I've heard it said about the Ten Commandments. These were, not, these were commandments, not suggestions. These are not the Ten Suggestions. But they're even more than commandments. They're words from the Lord. If you ever wondered, is there a word from the Lord? God has ten words that he wants us to know and hear and know what is important to God, and these are the ten words from the Lord. How many would agree with me that we need a word from the Lord? We need a word from the Lord. The next thing that I want you to know about the Decalogue is not just that they are ten words from the Lord, but they are our grateful response to a God who has already acted on our behalf. God does not say, if you keep these laws, then I will be good to you. If you keep these laws, then I will be gracious to you. What God actually said in the passage we just read, he says, I am the Lord your God. I brought you out of Egypt. I freed you as slaves. Not because you were law keepers. Not because you had been given the law. I did it. Why? Because I did it because of my own goodness. How many know that God is faithful even when we're not faithful? I mean, there's a, there, there's a principle in Scripture called hesed. It's God's covenant faithfulness. It's his faithfulness that's not 50-50 faithfulness. It's he's faithful even when we're unfaithful. Amen. It's a beautiful thing about God. And so when he gives them the Decalogue, he says, this is your response to what I've already done for you. And the next thing I want you to know about the Decalogue is that they are guiding principles for God's people of all time. I think there's a popular thought that, thank God we're living in the New Testament. We don't have to worry about the Ten Commandments anymore. Whew! got that over with. But the truth of the matter is, if you want to know what God cares about, if you want to know what God is like, you find it in these commandments. Jesus said it this way, don't misunderstand why I have come. I've not come to abolish the law of Moses 
or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish its purpose. Theologian Karl Barth said, the law is the form of the gospel and the gospel of grace is the content of the law. One, one writer put it this way, that it's like a cup of coffee. The, the, the cup is the form that it's in, but without the coffee, it's just hard and useless to us. And the coffee is the, is, 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 is the grace that's been given to us, but the grace without the cup has no form. And so the gospel comes to us, and we ha- or the law comes to us, and we have to hear the law, and we have to tremble at the law before we can experience this grace of God that he's given us. The next thing that I want you to know is, and, and there's a lot, there's, the law gets, uh, gets a, um, some bad marketing that, that, that the Old Testament's just full of, of uh, God wanting to make your life not fun. You know, that God sort of is mad at you and, and he's angry and it's just full of all of these thou shalt nots and all of these <coughs> things that you can't do. But the truth about the law and the commandments is this. The commandments are the pathway to life and joy. That if you want a life of joy, if you want a a life that is fulfilled, Psalm said the commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Proverbs said, keep my commands and you will live. Guard my teachings as the apple of of your eye. God's not interested in your misery. God is interested that you experience his joy and a a, a fulfilled life. Amen. The other thing that I want you to know about the Decalogue is that it teaches us how to love God and love our neighbor. How to love God and how to love our neighbor. In fact, It's the reason why the first tablet is four and the second tablet is six because the first four are all about loving God and all about how we as people are to relate to God. So here goes. We're going to get into the first four words from the Lord. Word number one, you shall have no other gods before me. The principle, the all-time principle that God is teaching us here is the principle of exclusivity. That God is, has the sole right for our affection and our attention and our love. There are other things in our society. There's money, sex, power, sports. I heard there was a football game last night politics, and even family, that if we're not careful, we can can make them our God. I want to let you know where you have come to this morning. You have not come to an evangelical rally for Donald Trump. You have not come to a Biden-Harris pre-election celebration this morning. You have not even come to a post-Tennessee Vols celebration Sunday. Because I understand there may be some Kentucky uh, Wildcat fans in the house. You have not come to a Black Lives Matter rally or a All People Matter rally. We have come this morning, and it's not about us at all. We've come here this morning to worship our God. Amen. And one theologian said that when we come to church, it ought to feel like we're coming into a foreign country. 
And that what happens to us while we're at church ought to be so disturbing that we leave and we're changed by what we've heard because we've been in the presence of God as we prayed this morning. Jana, as you prayed for me before service this morning, you prayed that God would manifest himself, that God's presence would be felt, that we would come here today and that we would be changed because of God. You shall have No other gods before me. So many things are competing for our love and our affection and our time. And God wants to have an exclusive relationship with us. Not that we have a cadre of gods and this is our best God. But but the word that the that the Jews pray twice a day is six words, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is only one God, and we've come to worship him this morning. Amen. Amen. That's a word from the Lord this morning. You shall have no other God before me. I heard the consternation during COVID-19 that it was possible that the Tennessee Volunteers may not be able to play their season. It was as if people had lost their God. I like the Tennessee Vols. I'm glad they won. But I can be honest with you this morning and say there were times in my life that sports was so important to me, it affected my mood over time if my teams didn't do well and all of that. I don't want to be in that place. I want to be in the place that whether my team wins or loses, I'm a child of God and he brought me out of slavery and he brought me out of bondage and he's the one that deserves my soul affection, my soul love, my soul worship, and my soul honor this morning. Amen. Number two, you shall not make for yourselves an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth. This is the principle of living versus static. Is your God alive or is it dead? And God wanted us to know we serve a living God. And that when we make images to represent our God. The the writers are eloquent in the scripture about the idols. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. We serve a God this morning who sees us. We serve a God this morning who can hear our faintest cry. Aren't you glad this morning that we serve a living God? Amen. Amen. You shall not have any Graven image. The the name of God was so important uh, to, to, to God's people that they would not even pronounce it, which leads us to the third commandment. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. I, I learned it in the King James. You shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And we always reduced that to using God's name as a cuss word. And, and, and by the way, I do believe that that is taking God's name in vain. God's last name is not damn it. Amen. In fact, to utter those words has to be so perverse to God Because the scripture tells us about God. It's not his will that any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. And we throw his name around lightly. Use it as a byword. I 
I, I grew up old school. I mean, I was so old school. When I was in Sunday school, they taught against something. You probably never heard this word, minced oaths. Anyone ever heard of a minced oath? Okay, good. We got one more in the back. A minced oath was Christian cussing. <laughs> you know what Christian cussing? Christian cussing is when you take the word and you lighten it up so that we can say it. So you don't say damn, you say darn, right? Now I'm not up here. I'm not up here trying to change your whole language today, but I do want to say that God's name was so important that it had no vowels in it. They were not even allowed to pronounce his name, so they would substitute Adonai, which meant Lord. We say Yahweh, we add the vowels to it, but his name was so holy, and, and we take his name so lightly. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. How else do we take his name in vain? We take his name in vain when we, we give lip service to God, but our hearts are far from him. Scripture said, you worship me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. I've got the WWJD bracelet. I've got the cross around my neck. But I have no interest in really being a follower of Jesus Christ. I was talking to Eulen Washburn about preaching the Ten Commandments, and this comes as kind of a confession this morning. In all my years of pastoring, I don't know that I've ever preached on the Ten Commandments because I'm so anxious to get to the grace of God. And what these Ten Commandments do is they spell my doom. When I read the, 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 the Ten Commandments, it's, 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 it's absolutely convicting because if not in the letter at least in the spirit of all of the commandments, we fall short of the glory of God. And so we hear from this holy God, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And then finally, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. They, they criticized Jesus for healing on the Sabbath. But what they didn't know is that the Sabbath was literally created to be a healing day. It was created so that after six days of hard labor that you could rest and enjoy. And you could say God is good. And you could set aside time to worship the Lord. The principle there was the principle of relational rest. 40% of Americans do not get the recommended amount of sleep. Gallup polls say Americans take less vacation days, that we work longer, and we retire later than the rest of the world. 40% of, of Americans check their work email on vacation, 50% check it in bed, 30% at the dinner table. I wonder how many check it in church. And God made this day for us to rest. I've been thinking about during this COVID um, period, it's made it impossible for us for a time to worship in, together, live, in service. And so we went online, and people are watching online, and I'm so thankful for that today, that people are watching online. But I, um, I spoke to, um, back when I was still going to a barber, I spoke to a, my barber, and he said, yeah, when we, when we, um, First started this COVID thing. Our church went online. He said, we watched the first couple weeks, but oh, 
That's not the same. We're not going to watch church online. One of my great concerns during this time is that we'll get used to not worshiping. And I think sometimes when we come on Sunday morning, we we try to out-entertain the other churches. If we can have a better smoke machine or better band or if we can have Starbucks instead of Folgers, if, if, if our bagels are better, if we can do all of these things to sort of attract people to come on a Sunday morning to entertain people. One of the things that COVID has really challenged me with and is that we're not here to entertain you. We've come to a place this morning to worship the living God, and we'll never be as good at entertaining you as Hollywood is at entertaining you. Why don't we in the church get out of the entertainment business and get into the worship business? I got an inbox from a lady that I've not yet met. She said, I want to encourage you. We haven't found a church yet in Knoxville. And we were watching your church when you were meeting on the porch of your house. And she said, I'll never forget the sermon that you preached on Easter. It wasn't supposed to be this way. And she said, that spoke to our hearts. When this thing gets passed, We hope to come meet you and be in your service with you. Be easy for us, wouldn't it, to get back to church and get back in the competition of trying to outdo the other churches and all of that. You know what? We don't have we don't have the the, the finances to produce music online that's gonna sound like it's coming from a DVD. But we're going to sit on a porch with an acoustic guitar and we're going to worship the Lord and we're going to experience his presence. I'm radical about remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy. My kids know this about me. We go to church on vacation. You know one of the reasons I'm afraid about not going to church that I could get used to not going to church. And if we're not careful, we're going to become like another Europe. We're going to become like the rest of the world that's gotten used to not setting aside time. But we've come to a holy place to worship a holy God, to say there are no other gods before you, to say we're not going to make any graven image You are a living God. We've come, Lord, to say that we're not going to take your name in vain. We've come to say that we're going to remember the Sabbath and we're going to keep it holy. The scripture says this, You have not come to a mountain, to a place of flaming fire and to darkness, gloom, and whirlwind, as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai. For they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice so terrible that they begged God to stop speaking. They staggered back under God's command. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I'm terrified and trembling. But now I want you to listen to this. This is what you've come to this morning. This is why I don't want you to be afraid this morning. God did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And he says, no, you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, hallelujah, to the heavenly Jerusalem, 
to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. How many people are here this morning? Whatever you see that's here, there's thousands and thousands of angels that have gathered with us this morning. Amen. You've come to the assembly of God's firstborn children whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God himself who's the judge over all. You've come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven who've now been made perfect. It's something we call the communion of the saints. The early church believed that those who had died in the Lord were still part of the church and those are with us this morning and we're part of that church this morning. And then it says you've come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. Isn't that good news this morning? You've come to Jesus this morning. Jesus is the only one who kept the law to its fullest and he has paid the price for our sins. Shall we bow our heads and pray this morning? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we just invite you, Lord, into this place. Holy Spirit, we just thank you, Lord, that you did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And today, Lord, we come and our hearts are to worship you, love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. To have no other gods, to have no graven images, Lord, to not take your name in vain. To remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. We love you, God, and you're first in our lives. We confess this morning we have not loved you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. Forgive us, Lord God. Forgive us of our sins. Make us ready, Lord God, to receive you today. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. Amen. We're going to do something different today. I've invited Dan Rutherford and... Shan Rutherford, Tanner's dad and grandfather, to come. And they're going to lead us in communion. And um, there's little communion cups down there under your seats that you can get right now. You can work at opening them up. Open them maybe away from your body in case you spill it doesn't get on you. And wait and we'll take the, uh, the elements together. These pastors come from the Christian church tradition. And in the Christian church tradition, weekly communion is part of that. And uh, Tanner's tried to make a Christian out of me. (laughs) And we've actually started doing that in our church, taking weekly communion. And uh, it's such an important part of what we do. And so I'm going to invite Dan to share with us this morning, and then we're going to take communion together. As uh, Pastor Phil was talking about today, uh, talking about leaving Egypt and the journeys in between, one of the things that would make Egypt lose its great power was the Battle of Eleusis. And in that battle, the Persian army was going against the Egyptians. Am I staying in the... There we go. Um, the, the Persian army was going against the Egyptians, and the Persian army played a terrible trick on the Egyptians. Uh, They painted cats on their shields. They took dogs and cats and sheep and ibises and any other animal that the Egyptians found sacred and drove them before them into battle. The Egyptians would not fight with their gods running in front of them or towards them. They would not attack the other soldiers because their god, their cat gods that they were worshiped were painted on the shields and they were routed, and that route ended basically the the Egyptian dominance uh, in that area from that point on. Shortly after Alexander the Great would come through, shortly after that the Romans would come through. And the point is this, what you believe is, is determined so much about how you behave. And as we have our communion time, this is our time to remind ourselves what we believe. You know, see, the Egyptians lost because they believed in something that wasn't even real. We believe in something that is real. We believe in the, the risen Savior, the, 
the God who became man, who dwelt among us, who took on flesh, and who died on the cross, but who rose again on the third day so that you and I may have a chance for eternal life. So what you believe determines uh, how you act, how, so many things about your life. And so as we have this time of communion, I just want you to think about uh, what you really believe. Do you believe Jesus enough that your Monday and your Tuesday is going to look different, uh, just like your Sunday does? The Apostle Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians that uh, he had received this from the Lord, that on the night that... Uh, the Lord was betrayed. He took the bread, the loaf, he broke it, he blessed it, and he said, take and eat this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup in the same manner he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. Lord, bless these emblems, which are a symbol of your sacrifice, your love for us on the cross. We can never begin to imagine or to comprehend what happened on that cross as you bore the sins of all the world. That cup was a bitter cup because it included all of my sins and the sins of the world. So we drink it in remembrance of him, his great love. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everybody please stand.
as we're getting ready to close here, I just want them to sing this song one more time, sing through the chorus, but I would love us to just close out. I know we always close out in prayer, but it would be, it'd be great if we could just close out with a prayer on our own hearts and sing this song together as a heart. God, the things that are important to you, we're going to make important to us. And we care about the things that, are, that, that you care about. And we want to put you first in all things. And so as we sing this song one more time, let's just uh, uh, close our eyes. If you feel comfortable, you can raise your hands. But let's just say, God, we give ourselves to you this day. And we're going to make you number one in our lives. We bow our we thank you for this day we thank you for this time to gather together today and to put you first at the very beginning of our week lord as we celebrate sunday the day that you rose again from the grave god i ask you to be with each person this week lord you know the things that they are going to be facing this week the good the bad the in between and i ask you just to let your spirit dwell with us lord jesus and move in us lord but also move through us to the world around us in jesus name, we thank you and we praise you amen have a good week in Jesus.